Good morning. It's good to see you all out. I want to open by saying it's a uh, pleasure. I don't know if it's much of a pleasure. Let me rephrase that. It's an honor, but it is a pleasure. But being somebody who has to stand before God's people, knowing the holiness of God, you truly begin to understand that we must work these things out with fear and trembling. Because saints, we have a holy God, and he demands perfection. And there is no perfection outside of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the book of Isaiah. Does anyone know what Isaiah means? His very name means the Lord saves. Praise God. All right, that's the message. I'm going home. <laughs> so I want you to not forget that as we're going through these passages and I want to make a few salient points and those salient points it is my prayer that God would forever engrave them upon your hearts so that we as his people will never forget his word we are reminded as David wrote in Psalm 119 your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you how shall the young man and woman cleanse their ways by taking heed to the word. David would remind his people of these very truths. And same with Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. And it is not um, my goal here to get everything out of this text. I could probably be in this text for a year. There's much to be gleaned from here. Um, Isaiah has 66 chapters. It is full of warnings and it's full of promises that we can glean from. Isaiah served for 40 years and he was a great orator when he spoke God's truth. It's a great and wonderful book. Even August of Hippo years and years and years ago would call it the fifth gospel. He opens up the book in chapter 1 referring to a sinful nation. And that sinful nation were the ones that God had called out that had been dealing with the truth of God's word, his law, his prophets. He would call Zion a city, a, a city that is sinful. He spoke of true peace in chapter 2. He talked about the proud, that they will be destroyed. We hear of God judging Judah and Jerusalem in chapter 3, and we also hear about the women of Jerusalem, how that their eyes were full of wanting. They walked with stiff necks. They were proud in heart. And they walked around with bells so that the men would look at them in ways men ought not to look. We ourselves, if we're making comparisons to this country we live in called America that's been blessed with all of these blessings in material things, can see that these things that are written aforetime, whereas our pastor has been reiterating week in and week out, are written for our learning so that we can look back in history and see where this nation, the apple of God's eye, had forsaken the law and the prophets and sought after other nations and what was to become of those people after they did such things. So how much more, dear saints, as we have the truth, as our deacon spoke about week in and week out, that we get to hear the truth, how much accountability we have as believers. So moving on, we see that our Lord speaks of the future Jerusalem, making distinctions between 
a literal Jerusalem and a spiritual Jerusalem. Which one do you belong to is the question at hand. And then he goes into the parable of the vineyard. There are three things to consider as we go into this text that having a vineyard is laborious. It is laborious. Do you know what laborious means? That means you have to work by the sweat of your brow. A lot of work. If you have a garden, you know it's a lot of work. You have many things that are seeking to take over those things. And if you don't prune it right and you don't understand how the buds come out or how things are grown, it'll grow naturally wild. So there's a lot of labor involved. And that is what we call the protection of whatever we're tilling and growing. And if we don't take care of these things, what naturally happens are wild growth. And so in our text, we have wild grapes. This particular passage opens up, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching the vineyard. My well-beloved with a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So it starts out by talking about this vineyard being a very fruitful place. And if you can picture this in your mind, as I was driving here from Brentwood, California, seeing the meticulous vineyards that are growing as we go up Highway 4, you can see them in California here as you go up towards Napa, up towards Sonoma. We are in a wine-making state with many vineyards. But this is a song that I would refer to as somewhat of a blues song. It starts out good, but ends up, ends up so bad. But it was fenced in. It was fenced in. It was gathered out of stones. Did you know you have to take the stones out of the earth and for the vines to get proper water and to reach down deeply? What kind of stones were these? Well, we're going to see here. As we consider these passages in chapter 5, let us look onto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God on the throne. There are three things I want to look into. The perfecting of his people. The profession and understanding predestination, and the purpose, why this was planted on a fruitful hill. This particular perfecting of God's people is definitely a work of God. We believe in sovereign grace, but God makes us responsible. He's put a new song in us, saints. The old song's gone. We have a song of life a song of rejoicing, a song that we are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can come to church and sing knowing our victory has been won. Hallelujah. Amen. That there is this vineyard that is eternal and not temporal. That he has protected us and planted us with vine dressers, those who meticulously preach the gospel and cut away at the wildness of our own nature. So it is important to continually come under the gospel to be manicured as a God's vineyard. We know that he's speaking of uh, the church, both corporately and eternally, when we see in verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. But as I have made mention before, there are two Israels, one that is the true church of God and one is that it is temporal. The land of Palestine that now exists, where you have those who call themselves Jews, and I am not anti-Semitic. If there was ever a Jew, I am one. My grandma was a Jew, and if we, take, if we shake our family tree uh, hard enough, we'll find out that we have Jewish people in our tree, mainly being Adam. 
So stop the critical race theory. It's a joke. It's, it's not right. It's a, a farce. It's not true. We are the human race, and we understand this. We are all related. We all have the same sin nature, the propensity to grow wild. Well, we live in a day when the church has gone wild. And there's no preachers preaching against it, save a few. But all it takes is a few, saints. So let us not run in vain. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in time, God will give us the reaping of telling the truth. At cutting away of those things which are untrue. I just heard a report that the Methodist church had the audacity to allow a man dressed as a woman claiming himself to be a pastor. How far have we gone? And how far will it go? It's a sobering thing to think about that which is good is called evil and that which is evil is called good. And so bring on the persecution because let us not be so named as those who would accept, accept such perversions when it comes to God's holy church and his true vineyard. God have mercy on us. We sing a new song, saints. We sing, Thou art worthy to take the book. When we sing to the Lord Jesus Christ and to open these seals thereof, for you were slain, he was crucified, and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and every tongue and people and nation. And the perversions that are in the land need to be spoken against. Because when he, we, when he judges, he uses his church to be the spokesman for his truth. We are indeed the body of Christ. He is the head. But God is perfecting this song in his people. It's a song that we still sing. And it's a song because he wanted his people to remember this song about this parable of the vineyard. This earthly story with heavenly meanings. And he wants us to remember it, so he put it in song form. Where is the first place that we saw a vineyard in Scripture? It was in Genesis chapter 6, when we see Noah taking all the animals into the boat. Did you know what he took with him? He took a vine. He took a vine with him. And I was asked one time years ago, what does this mean spiritually when Noah took and planted a vineyard after all this destruction came upon the earth and everyone perished? And there were only eight souls in the boat and the animals and those things which he had on there to grow. And the simple answer is this. If you saw the world end, those who you grew up with, those who you played basketball with, those who you played with as children all perish. I think the first thing I'd want is a drink. <laughs> now, don't get it twisted, saints. God has given us wine for our, making our heart merry. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived by it is not wise. We've all fallen into this mischief. But God is faithful. We don't want liquor store preaching. We want the preciousness of the gospel, which is without price. It takes a long time to make wine. It's a long process. And the price of good wine is without any money to buy it. This profession of the vindresser and the predestination, this Noah did this so that when he saw everyone perish, him and his wife would go into the tent and use this as a way to procreate. That's why we see the first miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ making wine 
in that place called Cana of Galilee. It just makes it a lot easier to procreate. But you know what? When we hear this parable of the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5, all of the children of Israel knew this. They all knew the historical data that was put in the book. They all understood that Noah had a vineyard. But later as we go on, we're going to find that there's two vineyards in view here. We understand it as we're going to be partaking today in the Lord's table, that when our Lord, he took bread, he gave thanks when he was with his disciples before he went to the cross and he broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. He also said, take this cup, for it is the blood of the New Testament. We don't believe in transubstantiation, where the blood actually becomes the real blood of, of Christ. That's foolishness. It's representative of what Christ went through when he was on the cross, and he was pierced in his side, and out forth came blood and water. And he says this to do it in remembrance of him. And we remember these things just as the children of Israel had to remember this vineyard. And what was the purpose of this very fruitful hill? The purpose was to understand that you've been given the gospel, the gospel wine of God's free and sovereign grace that you can drink freely. It's a wine that doesn't give you a headache when you wake up. It's the wine that makes you feel refreshed. It's the wine that takes the burden off your shoulders. It's the wine that lets you relax after working very hard. It's the wine that gives you grace to deal with the things that in, without it you wouldn't be able to deal with. And that's why you have to understand that real wine can mock these things can mock these things it can make you feel good for a while until you start drinking it too much and you'll look into the glass and you start seeing silly women dancing in it <laughs> then you get beat up and here's the crazy thing you wake up and say i'm gonna do it again that's not the wine we're talking about Wine maketh the heart glad. That gospel wine makes the heart glad. It makes the heart of man glad. And oil to make his face to shine. And bread with strength in my, man's heart. That's Psalm 104, verse 15. But these things we're talking about spiritually. We know that wine maketh the heart glad. That gospel wine. And then there's the folly of worldly wine. It is the mocker. It's the strong drink that's raging, and whosoever is deceived by it is not wise. Let us keep Christ in view, saints. We know that the book is written about him. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. But God here in our text, he fenced this vineyard in. He took out the stones and he planted it with the choicest vines and built a tower in the midst of it. You know what that tower is? It's a watchtower to make sure no animals will come in, no pest. And oftentimes you would put roses at the head of each row of vines. The rose was there because the rose was sensitive enough to detect funguses, and those would be affected first. So it was the first line of defense against funguses. But God would put this watchtower to make sure no one was going to steal those grapes. Nothing was going to enter in to come in and take those things. What is the name of the Lord? It is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it and are safe. And it gives us view of those things which could attack our vineyard, called the church, the true church. Are we being those watchmen in the tower? Or have we come down and started drinking the wine and forgotten about the tower that even exists? in this thing we call the vineyard. The vineyard takes maintenance. It takes maintenance. My wife gets after me for not maintaining 
our fruitful 15 trees, fruit trees. It's a challenge to keep those things in order. So what did I do? I hired somebody. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that, folks. That's why you have a pastor. That's why you give an offering. Because a lot of these things we can't do. We're out there laboring, toiling, banging our heads against the wall. He's not a hireling, but we pay him because he's worthy of treading out the corn. It's a blessing to have a faithful pastor maintaining your garden. And really, he's just a mouthpiece for the Lord. But he knows through experience for you who desire to be elders and bishops and rulers and leadership in the church, you must have experience because you're going to be dealing with the things that affect families, the folks that belong to God's true vineyard. And it takes experience on how to make things right, to cut things right without damaging them. This is a very tall order. That's why you're to hold your elders and your pastors into double honor. We have to answer to God. This is a scary thing. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. It takes maintenance. We see this demonstrated in the New Testament when Paul the Apostle talks about him planting and Apollos watering, but God giving the increase. It's not neither he that planteth anything, neither him that watereth, but it's God that gives increase. But it takes experience to understand what makes things grow properly. And it takes God working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Working out these things with fear and trembling. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We see in Psalm 78, verse 2, that God will open his mouth up in a parable. And we see this here. And God will do these things to warn of those things which can take place, that have taken place, and will take place if we don't heed the warning. There are places where we see here, what could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done? That it should bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. He took out the stones. We know that there's a seed, the gospel seed, it's cast out and the Lord is the one who does it and some of those seeds can fall on the wayside and the devil comes quickly and snatches them up just as the birds come down and take the seeds and eat them. Then there's the stony places. They receive it. The roots go down quickly. There's rejoicing. It looks like this is going to be fruitful and then it withers away because it didn't take deep root. And then those seeds are cast down in thorns that choke that which is growing up. How many times have you felt that, saints? How am I going to pay my bills? I've spent too much money. How am I going to take care of things? The riches of this world start choking us up. We've been living beyond our means. God have mercy. And God sends his vine dressers gospel preachers and so carefully takes the thorns out one by one and this is what he's done in our parable he's taken away the stony places there was no excuse for this nation of Israel to become wild group, wild grapes God is caring for his vineyard he made it good ground We're told in Hosea, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. 
How do you do that? Break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. How do I do that? Here's a demonstration. Father, help us surrender every past experience, every unhealed hurt, every unresolved issue, and unmet need over to you. We surrender all, Lord, to you. Have mercy upon us, O God. We have sinned against you, and you alone have we sinned as your people. Heal us from the thorns that have choked us. Take away the stones that have kept us from going down deep. Plant us in good ground, Lord. The example. God, have mercy. Do you think God won't come to those who are crying as such? Every one of us are experiencing something in this wicked and untoward generation. But call upon Him while He's near. We sang it, stand on the promises, even when you think you're sinking. Sow to yourselves in this righteousness which is found only in one person, in Jesus Christ, who was the very personification of this book, who left glory to come down and be your vindresser. Break up the fallow ground. How do you do that? Look into the words. Show me, Lord, where I've erred. Show me where I'm sinful. Show me where I have not loved the way I'm supposed to. And that ground, that hard ground will be broken up. There's the premise that he's hedged with protection. And that's called the church of the living God. God will penetrate these earthly hearts And he'll take out that heart of stone and he'll give you a promise. It is the power of the wine press that we preach because ultimately these grapes that are grown go into, the, they go into a wine press where there was only one person that could go into that wine press and endure it and that was Jesus Christ himself when everything was ratcheting down on Christ to produce gospel wine so that all of our sins would be forgiven and we can drink and be happy of this gospel wine. This premise that we're hedged in with protection. What do you mean premises hedged with protection? I'm going to kind of go slow today, saints, if you don't mind. This protection that we have as seen all throughout scriptures. Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 1. You can turn there if you'd like. Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. Many theologians talk about this being a political thing. But what kind of player takes on that many women? except Solomon. I have one woman, that's all I want. She's been exactly what I need. <laughs> but you're going to learn some things with that many women, and Solomon learned some things. Pharaoh's daughter, and brought her unto the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house, and the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about it. You see, walls are meant to protect you from other invading nations. And I can't help but think about where we are today, where our borders are wide open. Now, I did mention 
God saves out of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. But why isn't your neighbor breaking down your f- the fence and saying, hey, come on in anytime you want? Because we want our privacy. We want our protection. Breaking down the borders of nations has always been its demise. We want foreigners to come in, but we want foreigners to come in that have our best interest. So those, I'm not trying to be a politician here, believe me, but we were, as we learn in Scripture, to entertain strangers. Because entertaining strangers, you might be entertaining God's elect. But there were things put into laws that said, okay, let them go through these processes to make sure they do have your best interest. Because if you just let them all in, the enemy will come in and start picking away at things that will destroy your nation. Doesn't that sound simple? But yet, our ruling body of politicians today don't want to have any borders. We're reminded in the psalm, Psalm 51, verse 18, Do good in your pleasure unto Zion. Build you the walls of Jerusalem. These were borders to protect. Isaiah even said it later on in chapter 22, verse 10, And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. They understood the wall is important. So... The protection of this vineyard we see in our text was protected not only with fencing, it was protected with a watchtower. But as we see in a spiritual sense, we need to protect our own nation just in a practical sense in our own homes with certain fences that the enemy can't get over. And one of those fences is called the law of God, the Decalogue. And let us not forget the law, saints. It was there to fence us in, to keep us contained, understanding our need for a Savior. It was like a watchtower that when it saw enemies coming in, it would point you to what what is right with God. And therefore, when you know what is right with God, you turn from that which is wrong. It was a school bus that we'd all get into and take us to our destination, which is Christ. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, in its simplest form. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the Lord's God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet or lust after anyone else's things. And this was what was taking place. All these laws were being broken by the nation of Israel at this time. And that's what caused this vineyard to grow wild grapes. Wild grapes meaning perversion. Wild grapes meaning enemies coming in and destroying the very things, them worshiping after the idols of other nations, all these laws they just chose to forget and not go back to to understand how sinful they were. And I now go to, in verse 5 of our text, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof because of the forgottenness of the law because the forgottenness of what it means to have walls around you, protecting you, and those walls can be those gospel preachers. You want a wall of truth being told to you week in and week out. We are not Sabbatarians here where we just don't do anything on the Sabbath day. You tell your wife when she's hungry, I'm not buying you anything because it's Sunday. That's going to get you in trouble. (laughs) We do keep it holy. We come, it's the day the Lord has given us to meet together and to hear the truth and that it is holy and sanctified for his purpose and his work. The penetrated earth that must be done to make a vineyard 
and the heart of stone to flesh. And what is this promise? Where are the most ugly stones located in a vineyard? And what do these stones look like? It's called the heart. The heart. God refers to our hearts as being stones. How can you tell somebody has a stony heart? You who have had kids, do you remember the first time your kid said, no? (laughs) And now you start praying and you say, Lord, soften that heart. Soften that heart. Because we all have these ugly stones before God saves us. And when he puts in the heart of flesh, we understand how ugly our hearts are. A new heart. This is New Testament language spoken about in Ezekiel that we have, which makes this vineyard a workable vineyard. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a new heart of flesh. And this is where a heart of flesh can take the seed of the gospel and it matures it and it it causes it to have that promise of growth and potential to do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Let us make good ground, saints. I remember Ezekiel of old, him saying, Cast away from all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? They chose not to do these things, not to trust in God, to do this supernatural work of trans transplanting hearts of flesh and put in hearts of flesh when they had hearts of stone. And thirdly, we see that this vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. Isn't that what's taking place upon this nation, oppression? But why does that happen? Does it happen because of what, who we vote for? No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter who you vote for. Judgment begins in this vineyard we call the church. And if these things are not preached in the church, it's like the stone that is cast into the pond. It creates ripples and it works its way out into society. And so when you see the evils in society, know this, saints, that it is evil taking place in what God would call a vineyard his church how much are you accountable you pastors who have neglected to tell the truth you thought by saying God has an elect that your church would diminish diminish in size well look at this church we chose to say God does have an elect chosen in him before the foundations of the world and this church has increased God blesses truth. He doesn't bless lies. And we are the example. Thank you, God. It's not anything we developed on our own. We just simply said, we're going to tell the truth. There's freedom in the truth. There's liberty in the truth. There's gospel wine in the truth. No headaches. Oh, man, that goes far. This power of the wine press, this final production of the vineyard. He looked for judgment. He looked for those who were telling the truth. He looked for those who were going to preach the gospel, whether it costed them their their lives. For righteousness, but behold a cry. There's a cry. There's a cry because within this nation... There were those who were of the true vineyard that could never be destroyed, the true Israel of God that were connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ, who were always hedged, who were always being watched out for. And they are still crying to this day the truth, warning those who are going astray. Isaiah 63, verse 3, you can put that up on the screen. It talks about this wine press, this power of the wine press, where he speaks about what I would see as a twofold wrath. One, our wrath, 
which is deserved, and secondly, our enemies. He says in Isaiah 63, verse 3, the ultimate production of grapes, the wine which is uh, made by grapes. It says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. There are two gardens in view that we heard from our deacon. One was the Garden of Eden, where they were given coats of skin as pictures of Christ clothing them. And then there's the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And why is this? Because he was treading the wine press alone. And if you were in him, all the wrath that you deserve was pouring out of his pores. And every wrench of, if you ever made wine, it takes some intense pressure to get all the juice out. And then when you're Jewish like me, you want to get every drop of that grape juice out because you know you couldn't afford more grapes. Pressing down hard and sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, getting every, every ounce of that gospel wine out of our Savior so that we could drink throughout all eternity and be free from all of our sin all of our transgression, it's all been put away, and we drink. We rest our heads on our beds knowing that wrath has been passed away. We rejoice knowing that, hey, there is nothing you got on me. You might have recorded it, but God threw away the recording. You might know me back back then, but that's not me anymore. He's given me a new spirit. I hate myself, but I love myself in Christ. This agony, it was agonizomai. He was in agony. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, at were, as it were, great drops of blood falling into the ground, making it good ground, a ground where we can grow as a vineyard. The psalmist, the sweet psalmist under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said it this way in Psalm 60, verse 12. Though God... Through God, we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Twofold, our own wrath that we deserved, he endured, and he will take care of our enemies. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. All you who continue to do wickedly and seek to hurt God's vineyard will be trodden at the day of judgment. As I was looking in my studies, I saw the book of Joel. And Joel addresses the farmers and the vindressers, urging them to lament the disaster caused by the locust plague of invaders. The locust plague of invaders. Do we have these things? These people that are coming after our children, making laws that say, we have the right to take your child, and if they tell us they want to get their reproductive organs changed, we don't need your permission anymore. These are locusts. They're invading. No. Are you crying? Are you not the one who's crying? I hear it. But let us cry louder, saints. This is America. We have the Second Amendment, and it was to protect us and our children. And I say this with the utmost reverence, because I know you government officials somewhere are here of what we're saying. 
but you're not going to get my child. And remember the separation of church and state. Get out. We don't want you here. And if you are here, I pray that God would slay your heart and you would repent. The locust plague affected not only the drunkards and the priests and the worshipers. It was more than just agricultural. It also affected the farmers and the vindressers. The prophet called these people to lament, saying, Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, the gospel wheat, the bread which was made, which was symbolic of Christ himself. The reason for the call to mourning was because the harvest of the field is destroyed. Same thing happens here. History repeats itself. Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes. The called out ones, the ecclesia, the eclectos, the called out ones. There's nothing new under the sun. That which has been is and that which will be has been. There's nothing new under this sun. It's been cyclical. Even in the time of Jeremiah, when the Babylonian takeover was taking place and they were being hauled off to Babylon, all these who were in the nation of Israel there was a certain group of people that were left behind. And we read this in Jeremiah 52, 16. You can put that up on the screen. But Nebuchadnezzar left behind the rest of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and the fields. And we see this taking away of the church of God corporate, where they're being carried away into slavery the slavery of their minds, the slavery to not tell the truth, the slavery to accept those things which are evil and not speak out against them. But who was left? These poor vineyard dressers. Who are these poor people that were left and escaped the judgment? Who are these people that escaped the carrying away into Babylon. Who are these people that are escaped? All these wild locusts. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. How much, how much more do you want that than the riches of this world? Crazy thing is, is they probably got to drink the best wine, that gospel wine, as they meticulously took care of that vineyard vineyard God's vineyard historically what happens to the lethargy of an unmaintained nation it's called presumption to presume that God is not working these things in the world to presume God is okay with you accepting that which is evil and calling it good and Isaiah later on in his Wonderful writings in chapter 22, verse 5. You can put that on the screen. For it is the day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. These are serious things to contemplate. And how close are we to where this will take place in our own nation, in our own backyards? where we continually accept these things which are totally demonic and perverted. It's a presumption that led to wild grapes, and these wild grapes are perversion. The wild grapes of a cell phone that can be turned on at any time and watched all kinds of manner of evil. When Micah 6.8 he judges the kings and he judges us and he says here, He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require to you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now God can do anything, saints. He can turn this whole thing around. 
He can turn this whole thing around, this evil that we see. I believe that. He created the world in six days. How much more can he just turn around these things which are taking place? We must prepare in faith. We still belong to a property, which is his property of hope. We are still positionally positioned in a place of promise. Prepare the soil. Ask yourselves, where are you? Where are we? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard it, Satan cometh quickly. He comes immediately and he takes away the word that is sown in their hearts. Is that what happens to some of you here? Perhaps not everyone's saved here. I don't believe that. I believe that some of you were brought in here not knowing what you were going to hear today. Not knowing much about the word of God. And you've heard some things today. But as soon as you leave those doors, everything you heard will be taken away. Because you know what? Let God be true and every man a liar. This world is one big lie. Now you can find truth in there. But would you eat a cookie that had some dog poop in it and you couldn't see it was in there? The only pure, unadulterated truth is the word of God. There's those who will go out these doors today. They'll like what they heard. They'll like that there was forgiveness in sin. Half-heartedly, they will go out. They'll land on this thing called stony ground. And when they heard the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time and afterward... When affliction and persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended and they go back to doing what they've always done. Remain in the word, no matter how much it hurts, no matter what your feelings say, no matter how much persecution comes your way, there is a benefit for it all. I used to be six feet tall, and now I'm only five foot five. (laughs) But God's been extremely merciful to me. Things could be far worse. He's been faithful. Then there's those who will go out, and there'll be thorns. They hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulnesses of riches, and the lust of other things entering in. They choke the word, and they become unfruitful. These are they which are sown in good ground. These are those who are in good ground. Those who were put in good ground had the wayside removed. They had the stony ground tilled. They had the thorns taken off, and they were put into good ground. Such are as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Where are you? That's the question. Where are you? And if you're in a place where you can identify with one of these wayside, stony ground, or thorns, it doesn't mean that you're out of the way. You're brought here to hear these things so you can address it. Remain in his word. Remember his story. And this is where the nation of Israel had forgotten history. They had forgotten history. They had forgotten history. But there were those that were in there at this last verse where he says, Behold a cry. There were those in there that cried to remember what God has written. Have you not heard these things? God has warned us. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. This is Psalm 97. You can put that on the screen. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. 
Light is sown for the righteous, for gladness for the upright in heart. Where have we heard that before? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't end there. It talks about men loving darkness and not the light. He has sown to us light, the light of his word. Remain in the light and you will reap the blessings of dealing with all that will bring you down shall be taken away if you remain in the light. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. You are the property of hope. Hope, it doesn't make us ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For we are his workmanship. You see, he's the true vine dresser. This is what we're getting into. He's the one that meticulously goes to that true vineyard, which will never be destroyed, will never be hurt, never be infected, because he's always watching out for his people. Though we go through all these trials and tribulations, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, what we should walk in them that we should walk in them. And there's a parable of the hidden treasure. Where is this hidden treasure? Put up Matthew 13, verse 44. Most people get this uh, particular passage twisted, saying that, oh, this is a man, not Christ, but somebody who you know, buys up all the land so he can build a church on his own. No, this is God speaking about his son through a parable as his son would communicate it to us, that he left glory... The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. This man is Jesus Christ who left glory to come down to earth, which is this field, and covered it up because he knew his people were in it. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has so that he can buy it. He left glory so that he can come down and redeem a people for himself and have his own perfect vineyard for himself. And this puts us into a position of promise. For all the promises, as we know, of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. We're commanded in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, if you want to put that on the screen as well, that we should be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord. Now, Remember, we talked about the locust. We talked about what's happening in our world today. We talked about how our borders are being done away with. We talked about how they're coming after our children. We talked about how the church corporate has been infiltrated with all types of perversion. Don't dread it, he tells us. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God which goes with you. He will not leave you and he will not forsake you. And this is the promise they had back in the Old Testament, the same promise that Christ gave to his church. The promise has always been there to his true church. We have to guard our, hand, our, our hearts, guard our hearts with all diligence. Why? Because out of our hearts are all the issues of life. How do you know the condition of your heart? Well, let me sit, or, sit with you for a while and hear what you have to say. For out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, But he that built all things is God. We are God's property, and it is a property of promise. God hath built us up in him. He is the true edification of the church. Two vines, two vineyards have always existed since the time of Moses. One is in... uh, what we're reading 
here, and that is this Deuteronomy text in chapter 32, verses 32 through 33. Why don't you open your Bibles and look at this so that we can see clearly a distinction between two vineyards. The rebels, the religionist, the fakes, the frauds, the hustlers, the hucksters, the thieves, the robbers, the perverted. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. And remember, these fields look good, but their grapes are the grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp. Now, historically, when Christ had come and he was doing his ministry for three and a half years, Herod's temple was being built. And that temple had two big doors with pillars. And ancient scholars of antiquity uh, would write about these pillars being wrapped with a vine. You can look it up on Google and you can see that there's a vine that goes, a golden vine that goes all over the door. And there are those who would believe that when our Lord spoke about himself being not just a vine, he said in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. Because they looked to that temple as though it were something very special and magnificent. And they would all see this vine that went over the front door. But our Lord made sure that he told them, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it and it make, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Are you part of the true vine? Are you in Jesus Christ? Because that's where the fruit is produced, in Jesus Christ, in his word. Be in his word. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Stay out of the vineyard of Sodom and Gomorrah because it looks good, but it's there to destroy you and everything that comes out of it is poisonous. There is the true vine that is Jesus Christ himself. And he's the one that produces fruit in us. That is the true vine. And we look at the California landscape and we can see that this is a state of many, many vineyards. Beautiful as they are, do we drive by and forget the perversions that have been placed on our state? Do we drive by and forget about the homeless population on the wayside of our streets because of corrupt men in the church, in the church, in the church? You church folk, know who I'm talking about because many of you came out of these apostate churches that have fallen away from the truth. And so when you see the homeless population on the wayside, it is because of a church that failed to keep telling the truth. And they are held accountable for it. Not just the homeless population, but how about our dear sister Jackie and her valiant exploits to the schools that are preaching perversion where they have pictures of horrible things that our children are being subject to and laws being implemented that would take our children away so that these evil and wicked men can sodomize our children. 
I'm sorry I'm not the bearer of good news. But God is giving us news still. And there are still those who cry. There are still those who curl up in balls on their bed and cry out for their children. And God has heard your prayers. And God is going to do amazing things. He tells us he will. If that witness had been silenced, if there was no crying, I would submit to you we are in grave trouble. But there's a whisper, saints. There's a gospel whisper. As you look at the landscape and you see the hordes of perversion in our government and in our churches, God is still saving his people. There are those who are connected to the true vineyard, to the true vine, which is Jesus Christ, who will never be separated. And for those who sigh and cry, the Holy Spirit is seeking you out like a heat-seeking missile. And he's putting a mark on your forehead. You're safe in Christ. But we have to endure when we see these things. Jesus Christ paid the penalty of sin. And there's still time. The sun was risen today. And the sun will set. And every morning there's this thing called new mercies. Praise God, oh my soul.